Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marie-Laure Vercombe. I'm the Director General of the French Water Partnership. Welcome to World Water Week for those who are just joining us online today. And uh, thank you all for uh, joining us for this session on the reduction of uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions by um, uh, the water and sanitation services. Uh, just a few words about uh, uh, the French Water Partnership. So we're a multi-stakeholder platform. We have 200 members. Among them, you have, of course, water and sanitation um, organizations. Um, and But this publication that we're going to describe and talk to you about has been, is the fruit of the work of uh, uh, a joint collaboration with the International Water Association and of uh, lots of different expertise. We have here a representative of GIZ who uh, GIZ, uh, who um, contributed to uh, to that um, publication as well. Um, and so, yes, so you'll have a lot of uh, interesting case studies. We will also um, present this publication at the IWA uh, Congress uh, in just a few days from now and at the COP also in Sharm el-Sheikh, as it is very important to underline that there is a lot that can be done. Um, by the water and sanitation services, and thanks to them, uh, there is there is also a lot that a lot more than can be done. So, um, without uh, further delay, um, I'd like to give the, the floor to Corinne Tromsdorf, um, who's going to actually present the publication. Corinne. Thank you, Mary Love. Uh, let me just um, share my screen and uh, the presentation. So, um, what I'd like to share with you today is a very quick overview of uh, what is in that publication. Um, the publication is called Reducing the Greenhouse Gas Emissions of Water and Sanitation Services. As Marie-Laure stated, it is a, um, a collaboration between uh, the French Water Partnership and the IWA, as well as um, ASTE also contributed. So ASTE is the French uh, Water Professionals um, Association, similar to the IWA, the International Water Association, but at national level. Uh, and I'm here as um, I'm myself the CEO of uh, Water Cities, but I'm also a board member of ASTE and of the French Water Partnership. The book is um, an open access ebook, just so you know, and you have the, the reference on that slide. Um, so first of all, um, why, why this book? Why this book um, in this collaboration? Well, there is a climate urgency, as we all know, and as, as we've all experienced throughout the summer uh, and with all of what's in the news, uh, even in the, in the last few days. And actually, water and sanitation services um, have a share that they can contribute and need to contribute their share to decarbonizing our um, society. But also uh, they have a, a huge role to play in the adaptation uh, to the impacts of climate change. So this is really underlying why this book is here uh, and trying to uh, inspire uh, professionals and planners uh, towards decarbonizing um, the water sector. The context is also that there's a huge investment needed to achieve SDG 6, in particular SDG 6.3 on wastewater. And these investments um, can be either high or low carbon investments. So we will have a few choices to make in the future. And we want to inspire um, planners and professionals and governments um, into thinking this through so that their impact is as low as possible in terms of carbon footprint. And you know, another objective was to also share a little bit of the French know-how uh, on this topic. So what is in this book? Um, it has five chapters. Um, there's first, first of all, an overview of the GHG emissions of the water and sanitation services. 
then we have a zoom in on energy uh, and what energy requirements are associated to these services before we actually look at um, levers for action. So enablers and solutions for actually reducing the GHG emissions. But then as I stated at the, in, in the introduction, given that um, adaptation is actually a critical task that um, water and sanitation services will have to play, uh, we really wanted to have a, an, an additional chapter on how we can combine adaptation to reducing GHG emissions. Uh, and then the final chapter is, is um, a compendium of uh, case studies and examples of solutions of things that have been implemented on the ground and that can inspire others. Um, just giving you a glimpse of what you can find in that book. Uh, regarding the energy, um, What's interesting is to look at how much of the energy is actually uh, related to uh, the utilities themselves, so the services, and how much is um, related to the end users. And so we see that in many countries, you look at the top three bars, uh, in many countries, actually the end users have a lot more weight in terms of um, energy consumption related to water. And then in other countries, if you look down, uh, but further down, Spain, for example, the, the end users have a very low weight, but the utilities themselves have a stronger weight. So if you think about what that means, um, it's in some countries, solar energy is used for, um, water heating in domestic for domestic use direct solar heating then it doesn't it's not counted in then in the energy requirements of the country but these countries are also often countries that have more water scarcity issues and that might have to invest more into uh, energy intensive types of treatments like desalination or uh, sometimes up to reverse osmosis if um, they need to recycle a lot of water um, so depending on the type of, of, or the context of the country or the context of the utility, you'll have very different profiles in terms of energy use and also, uh, the weight of the, how much the end user, um, impacts the overall GHG emission of this activity will be different. Another quite interesting graph that you'll find in that publication is if you zoom in now just on the utilities, so we leave the end users on the side for a bit, we'll see that the activities or the, the, the types of, um, or the parts of the water cycle that have the most impact in terms of energy use are desalination, um, groundwater abstraction, so it's the whole pumping, pumping from deep under, uh, under the ground, and wastewater treatment. So these are the activities that we'll have to think most about when wanting to reduce um, energy consumption. Now, in terms of GHG emissions, um, you might find it interesting that there is no graph. Uh, there is no graph uh, because actually GHG emissions are a lot more um, variable than energy consumption. Energy is easy. Energy, you have uh, kilowatt hours that are measured and you can put them in a graph. Greenhouse gas emissions are the results of a very compli complicated calculation. You look at how much uh, is emitted from the process in terms of CO2, but in terms of uh, nitrous oxide, methane, and which are then translated into CO2 equivalent. You look at the energy that is consumed, and then you translate it into a CO2 equivalent, but that translation varies a lot from country to country. You take uh, Spain, or you take France, for example. France has a conversion factor of about uh, 50 gram per kilowatt equivalent, per kilowatt hour. So every time you use a kilowatt, 
that um, is counted in as 50 grams of CO2. If you compare it to Germany, Germany has a 400 gram co conversion factor. So utilities in France and in Germany can't really be compared in their GHG emissions related to energy because they have a huge factor of difference uh, when converting to CO2 equi equivalents. So this is why we do not have um, scientifically consolidated global figures on GHG emissions because the variabilities between countries, between types of utilities are just too different to um, present this in a very easy to read graph and like standardized graph. It would be interesting though to produce that and show that diversity at some point, but it's not done yet. Um, in the industry, there is still people who kind of try to estimate uh, what is the weight of GHG emissions overall uh, from the water sector? And uh, the numbers that are circulating is that it's about 3% of global emissions that can be attributed to water and wastewater services when accounting um, for their, their whole impact. So meaning it, it counts in the residential water heating usage. And just to give you a few orders of magnitude in terms of you know, what weighs in these, um, G in these greenhouse gas emissions in terms of water and wastewater services, uh, there's kind of a ranking of order of, of how much each weighs. So as we've discussed, end user water heating is, is a huge component in countries where fossil fuel is used for that water heating. The second one, which might become the first one in some countries if, if water heating doesn't rely on fossil fuel, um, is nitrous oxide from wastewater treatment. Um, and so this is counted in as, as, as this is a, what we call a direct emission or a scope one emission of the water and wastewater services. Nitrous oxide is produced uh, when um, wastewater that enters the treatment plant is treated through the aeration process. And then depending on the type of process, you'll have more or less nitrous oxide that is produced in, during that phase. The third uh, type of emission that weighs into the, the whole um, assessment is then the energy consumption. And again, in some cases, energy consumption might be the number one uh, uh, in your, uh, in, in, in the utility, if water heating is mostly direct solar heating, if uh, you have very low, you have processes that have very low nitrous oxide emissions, then your energy becomes your number one consumption or your, your number one uh, GHG emission source. Um, and in, in, in uh, regarding the energy pumping, um, globe, when you look at global figures, pumping, appears to be the one that is the most uh, important. So pumping water from place to place. Um, so the abstraction and um, bringing water to the right place for to supply cities and then the whole distribution system. And then the, the fourth uh, energy, uh, the fourth GHG uh, emission uh, in terms of quantity would be from wastewater. Now, I have not talked here about what we call the scope three emissions. So the whole supply chain, meaning all the chemicals that might be purchased or what happens to the products that leave the treatment plants like sludge, for example. This actually also has quite a, a significant impact, can be a quarter of the whole emissions of the, of the utility. But the assessments of these is quite new and there are not so many figures on that uh, at this date. So what's the publication really wanted to highlight once, once it has given that overview on emissions and energy and all that is really levers for action and uh, moving towards reducing the footprint of water and wastewater utilities through uh, reducing the direct emissions, so process-related emissions, using less energy, but then also producing energy 
producing new materials. So with that, you actually don't reduce your own emissions, but you offset the emissions of others, or you reduce your own emissions by using the, this energy or these new products that are low carbon instead of purchasing them um, outside. The book presents these levers for action as under three pillars. The first pillar is sobriety. It's about lean and efficient approaches. The second pillar is the circular economy. It's really um, about reusing uh, water, nutrients, and materials and producing energy with different shades of that uh, uh, ye yellow and, and orange, uh, different types of energy that you can produce. And then the third pillar is really about strategic choices. Um, so it's, it's more about this enabling framework that we might hear a little bit more about also through uh, presentations that come. It's about raising awareness and education within your utility, so in the staff itself, but also of the stakeholders you work with, of the governance and all that. It requires, making that change requires a governance that, that supports um, low carbon approaches that will support, for example, being able to produce energy as a utility or being allowed to sell energy to a third party. Um, then another um, strategic choice is also the whole um, tariff system having some uh, incentives for end users to use less water or incentives to um, reduce consumption in general. And the last one, but not least, is really regarding the supply chain. As I mentioned, this is something that utilities are just starting to look at, but that can be significant. You'll see in the book, you have this little schematic that then presents where each of those levers for action can be can be um, uh, implemented in which parts of the water cycle uh, it can be impl implemented. And then you'll have a summary of all the projects and the examples um, that are associated to each of those levers for action. So if you're interested in efficiency of services, you'll see that there is a bunch of case studies that relate to that. Utilities have been working on that a lot. Then on others, you'll you'll find a few, you'll find just one or two examples. So we really hope that this um, publication will actually inspire change and guide uh, future planning uh, of uh, water and wastewater services. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colin, for this uh, very detailed presentation about the, the book. Uh, my name is Geoffrey Lepilus. I'm working for the French Water Partnership as a program officer for uh, water and climate. Um, I want to introduce you to your next speakers, who is um, Diane Daras. I hope she can hear us. Yeah. And uh, perfect. Hello, Diane. Um, Hello. I will give you the floor with this uh, question. What can the water and sanitation sector do to reduce its impact as an energy intensive industry? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Geoffrey. I will need your help to, to show some slide. And we use uh, the slide, uh, some slide that uh, Corinne has presented. First of all, I'm uh, speaking uh, on behalf of uh, IWA, International Water Association, which I had the pleasure to be uh, the chair for four years. IWA has been very happy to uh, uh, co-sign this document, although it has been mainly done at the beginning by the French uh, Water Partnership, but then the translation has been done uh, together with uh, the French in order to be able to have a, an English uh, translation. And I'm happy of that because I think it's, uh, it's part of International Water Association to, uh, to help people to have access to, to document. Uh, and, uh, and it was important uh, for IWA and I thank the French Water Partnership for uh, helping us to, to do that. So uh, what I would like to comment 
is a bit to, um, to comment what action can be done. Uh, and of course, it's, uh, it's not directly IWA who can do things, but mainly the IWA members. Uh, so my, my first, um, I would say, uh, comment would be on the, uh, I don't know if you can put it uh, for, so that it can be, uh, is it, is it uh, visible by the, uh, by the um, or not? It's, is it still small or, or, or big? Um, so my first comment would be on the, uh, the slide that Corinne has presented on the energy use. I think this uh, slide is absolutely uh, fundamental. It's very important because unless you have a kind of vision of how much water the water industry uses uh, energy, uh, you, you can't really mobilize. I mean, if you think that it is nothing, you would say, well, there are so many other um, industry partner who should do something. And by looking at that figures, you see that the impact of water in the economy and of in, in proportion to what is done in a country can be very important. Of course, there are big differences because it's a percentage. So being a percentage, it depends a bit of what is done by the others. Uh, but, but it is interesting because even if uh, there are big difference between countries and, and uh, places, because uh, between uh, Europe or, or United States, there could be quite difficult, different uh, order of magnitude. It showed that yes, the water is a source of uh, uh, energy consuming. And we as professional, we really need to mobilize in order to reduce, in order to have mitigation. And we know probably more than the others that if we don't, if there is no mitigation of climate change, it will be a disaster for, uh, for the water because water will be the first big act of climate change. So we have a responsibility of, uh, of being also actors by, by um, reducing uh, the energy use. Uh, reducing the energy use, there is two things. And again, that slide is very interesting because there is two figures. In dark blue, you show how much the utilities or the uh, companies or the, um, how much you need energy to deliver water, to treat water. But when you look at how much energy you are using when you are a consumer, then you discover that it's much more. So when you deliver water, you deliver it as cold water. And afterwards, uh, the water has to be uh, most of time transformed, heated in bath, in a shower, in your uh, washing machines. And so you discover that the main impact of, uh, on energy is not to deliver water or to treat water, although it is, it is, there is an impact, but it's in the use of the water. And I want to stress that because as uh, utilities, most of time, we don't act really in order that our, the end user can be much more uh, clever about the impact of uh, uh, the uh, usage of the water. So I think this first slide is very, very important because it shows that the utilities have two responsibilities. First of all, reduce themselves uh, the energy they are using, but second, help the end users to reduce the, uh, the impact of the use of water. And that is probably a kind of revolution in the water business. So if you can uh, bring me the second slide, Please, uh, Jeffrey, thank you. So there you have um, a lot, again, Corinne was explaining that there are lots of possibility uh, to act. That's what is uh, proposed uh, by, um, by the study, is example and helping people to, to think about and see where they could act. Um, again, I think there will be a presentation later on on, on wastewater, so I'm going to focus more on the uh, drinking water. Uh, I think the, the word sobriety is probably something which we really need uh, to keep in mind. Um, we can live very well, we can be very happy by developing more sobriety. And it is important, and I think IWA is pushing 
people uh, to be uh, to to have a better attitude in that. And of course, it's sobriety for the water utilities, and I will comment it a, a bit later by more efficiency, uh, by being more ef efficient, by by re using better the the tool the in tools they have. And in IWA, of course, we work a lot on that. But there is also reducing water and wastewater uh, energy consumption by the end user. And I think that, again, that message is probably a, um, a new message or a message that is not so easy to understand or to hear. Because we still, in the uh, utilities, have a difficulty uh, to uh, help our consumer to reduce their consumption. It's clear that when you are a company, private or public, uh, the uh, revenues you have from, uh, from uh, the end users are linked to volumes. The more water you use, the more the revenues. And practically two thirds of the expenses of the utilities are fixed expenses. It's, uh, it's linked to uh, uh, um, management of the assets, it's linked to people, but not really linked to uh, the volume of water. Um, so how can you manage to push your hand user to reduce their consumption, which means to reduce the revenue of the company, meanwhile you want to have uh, a stable and a sustainable economical um, situation. So we need to develop a better understanding. IWA is developing also um, lots of uh, discussion with regulators, water regulators, in order to help to find a new way of, um, of regulating the water price in order to push people to reduce the consumption. Meanwhile, of course, you work on this long-term sustainability of the utility, because if you are too aggressive, or if you don't think of rethinking about um, the revenue, you could go in a difficult economical situation for the utilities. And of course, it's not what we push and what we expect. But uh, that message is probably one of the most difficult message today, because if you reduce, if you push people to be much more aware of uh, their water consumption and water usage, because um, beside the water consumption, some usage are more ex not expensive, but more have more impact on the energy, will uh, link to um, the hot water uh, usage. So you need really to push and move, and it's it's meant the kind of uh, uh, revolution in the way you 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 manage. Uh, the um, revenue of the utilities. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, on that slide, I would it would be la the last slide again of Corinne, but I would like to comment example. On that slide, you see that um, the um, inside the utility, when you go back to uh, the um, consumption of energy of the utility, you have big differences depending of if you are in the groundwater treatment, desalination, or, or, or if you are on the waste water part. Uh, the waste water part or the uh, uh, treatment for recycling are cost, energy cost, uh, need energy. Uh, so of course, that kind of slide can help to say, where should I focus more? How can I reduce my consumption by looking? And you see that there are some big differences because of course it's um, the the uh, slide shows differences depending where you are. So again, that is a topic where IWA as a, as association is really developing through its uh, specialist group uh, work in order to be more efficient uh, to work on uh, reducing uh, the energy uh, consumption, and um, and it is little by little, and of course technology. Uh, will um, really help um, slowly to uh, to reduce and to be more efficient. Uh, IWA has uh, more than 50 uh, specialist groups and 
most of specialist group are looking at that part and how can you be more efficient. So the efficiency of the utility is absolutely clear. So I would like to um, sum up by saying that we need to work on everything. Um, it's, uh, it's important to be, um, to be uh, efficient. Uh, IWA has, uh, has uh, worked in the past in, uh, and is still active on uh, the uh, water-wise uh, cities, which gives some principles. So it is also a way of having the uh, global vision and looking where you can work in order to be more uh, efficient. And on those principles, which are uh, quite interesting, I would stress again, and it would be my last slide, please, next one. Or maybe it's, it's okay. Do you have one more, Jeffrey, or not? Okay, okay, that's fine. That's the last one. Okay, good. Well, all are important, but the four axes is on uh, working with the communities, with your end user, in order to um, mod modify a bit their, their own impact. I think it is important, the utility inside to be efficient, but it is very important also to understand that we won't do that without working together with the um, external uh, community and for, of course, the end user. Thank you very much. Thank you, Diane, um, for this uh, really insightful presentation. As you mentioned before, uh, you focus on the drinking water because now we will have uh, another speaker from a sanitation service and from the Greater Paris uh, Sanitation Service, uh, Monsieur Antoine Campin. Um, your organization manages sanitation services for 9 million people daily. Uh, so how are you dealing with climate change mitigation? Hi Geoffrey, thanks for the question. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Antoine Quentin. I'm an engineer at SLAP. This is a great uh, Paris Sanitation Authority. And I uh, will present to you today the low carbon strategy that we are currently building. So first, there is a map to locate the SLAP uh, area, which is inside the same district of the European Water Framework Directive. The population of the SLAP uh, in blue area represent half of the population of all basin uh, in red boundary, nearly 9 million inhabitants over 18 million inhabitants. On this map, you can see the SIAP facilities. The two first mission of, of SIAP are the final transport and the treatment of uh, wastewater. SIAP facilities are composed of uh, 400 kilometers of sewage transport and network, and six uh, wastewater treatment plants. Um, these plants are total capacity on dry weather of uh, 2.4 million cubic meters per day. On this slide, we, we, we can see the objective along SIAP histories. The first one was to achieve a sufficient treatment capacity uh, the crossing curve between the treatment capacity and the sewage production was happened in 2007. This is a recent story. Then next, we have to improve this treatment quality to comply the European Urban Wastewater Directive. And then a significant decrease of ammonium discharge was observed in the Seine River, especially downstream, downstream the Paris region. To conclude with the water quality, the current challenge for sanitation is to make uh, the Seine and Mount swimmable again, because the city of Paris is hosting the Olympic Games, and in 2024, we have to swim for the triathlon events. Once uh, an objective is reached, we have, it has to be maintained and uh, with the new objective, all this objective are cumulative. And we have to do this while we have to mitigate and adapt to climate change and other systemic change. On this slide, we can see that the river Seine has to cope with a high human pressure, 
we can compare with two other French cities and their rivers, Strasbourg and Lyon. It means for Paris that to achieve the water quality goals, high level of performance in sanitation are required. And here I start with the sustainable development. SIAP have, uh, since 2012, uh, a strategy with three main axes. The first one is to reduce SIAP ecological footprints by preserving ecosystem and natural resources. The second one is to fight against climate change and reduce greenhouse gas emission. And to, to finish, meeting local women and men expectation. And this year on April 12, the board of SIAP have officially approved to update this uh, sustainable development strategy. And the main challenge of this up update is to the integration of the national low carbon strategy objective called SNBC within the activities of SIAP. And this strategy is complying with the Paris Agreement established in 2015 during the COP21 in Paris. For information, I put a link to the European Commission website where all the national strategy are listed for many countries. So for France, this strategy, National Low Carbon Strategy, SNBC, was introduced by a law about energy transition law and green growth in 2015. The SNBC is the French uh, roadmap to fight about climate change and is declined for each activity sector. So to, compare, to comply the Paris Agreement, France must go from 458 megaton CO2 per year in 2015 to 80 megaton CO2 in 2050, or divided by six the French emission. This is definitely a huge step. The national low carbon strategy have sectorial guidelines for transport, building, industry, etc. And for example, for the transport, the target for 2050 is to reach zero emission, not zero net, but zero. And the emission reduction target for sanitation, so for SIAP, are included in the solid waste activity sector. In France, since uh, 2010, there is an obligation to carry out um, a GIG assessment every three than four years for company, public uh, establishment, and communities. So SIAP uh, calculates this uh, GIG assessment since uh, 2020 with scope one, two, and three, but the scope one and three was not fully calculated. On this, gra on this graph, uh, we can see the SIAP uh, history greenhouse uh, assessment, greenhouse gas assessment. The main variation is due to uh, building emission in, uh, in orange. And uh, there is no significant change, no increase or decrease. So before the implementation of the national low carbon strategy at the SIAP, we need to consolidate our GAG assessment in uh, three steps. The first one is taking into account emission of N2O. Uh, as you know, th this is a gas with a strong green gas effect. Uh, second one is taking account of uh, biogenic emission, not in the official report, this is not request. And the final steps is to taking account about the scope free emission considered with significance. And to do this new assessment, we first use the ECAM, which is a, an open source online model of uh, IWA. And um, for the example, in 2015, we reached uh, 780,000 tons of CO2. So we are five times bigger than the previous uh, assessment. 
Um, if, if we focus on the year 2018, so this is not the final draft, this is still a work in progress. And here we are um, calculating the majority of the three scopes. And the main uh, emission come from the scope one, in particular due to uh, N2O emission during the wastewater treatment. Uh, this is representing more than 50% of SIAP emission. Uh, then come the scope three in blue, uh, related to incoming transports or outcoming transports and building. And finally, the scope two in yellow, uh, which is mainly linked to the CO2 emission factor of uh, electricity. And in France, thanks to nuclear power, we have uh, one of the lowest carbon electricity. So maybe uh, in other countries, this scope uh, could be more significant than uh, in France. We also calculate um, the biogenic emission and um, all the avoid emission that um, uh, we uh, avoid emission are made by consumption of our biogas instead of buying natural gas on markets. So we did this calculation for um, uh, 2015 and uh, until 2021. The starting point, the Paris Agreement 20, 2015 is our starting point. So we uh, put um, the national uh, objective of the French uh, low carbon strategy and we SIAP have our objective to 2030 and 2050. Uh, at this point, we are able to start building um, a strategy, the first big line of this strategy. And uh, this is still a work in progress, not, uh, not uh, the final draft. And at this point, we have uh, four big steps. The first one is to consolidate the exploratory work we did with ECAM and develop a new model that will mix ECAM and the French regularity requirement. After that, we will build the low carbon strategy of SIAP with this objective to reduce by 37%. And after we develop, we will develop an action plan with the, the, all the, the list of action we can uh, do to reduce emission. So we start to, to, to think about what could be this, uh, this action. And as we uh, saw in the assessment of uh, GHG emission, a major immediate challenge is to reduce the N2O emission. So this is uh, a, big, uh, a big step. After we have to, to rely on uh, SIAP innovation, um, on CO2, maybe do some capture or recovery. We have to developing investment to reduce um, or avoid emission. And this is the technical part. And after we have to think about the social part and the cultural ruptures, like um, all the, the resource recovery that they are in the wastewater and to think at the source management for stormwater, for urine, etc. So if we focus on uh, N2, N2O, sorry, uh, where comes the emission? Uh, there's two main technology to do the water treatment and uh, biofilter on, um, on the right have an emission factor of 57% uh, uh, bigger than another technology that called activate slug. And in SIAP, 66% of our um, uh, treatment goes through this biofilter. Just to remember that all this nitrogen not goes in the river. This is our first mission uh, of sanitation um, is to avoid the, the river pollution. And over the year, we improve the quality of the river. And 
So how can we uh, reduce the N2O emission? We, uh, this is just a beginning, but there is many questions, but maybe in short term, we have to increase aeration airflow. So we will uh, rise the energy consumption, uh, maybe change the water treatment process. This is uh, the kind of question we can ask in ourselves or reduce the incoming nitrogen load. This is where the, the urine, the urine uh, uh, at, the, at the source is maybe a solution. On the other hand, um, there is a CO2. And uh, thanks to um, our wastewater treatment mission, we have our disposal, a large stock of biogenic carbon from, uh, from food. So we could uh, use it pro to produce our arm methanol, for example, or we can uh, change our fleet, fleet of diesel trucks to biogas trucks with produce with our own biogas. The, the challenge is to, to, to go from carbon fossil to carbon biogenic. And also there is still uh, many questions here. And say, thank you for, the, for your attention. Uh, thank you, Antoine. Uh, now we can welcome our on-site speaker, <laughs> uh, who is Martin Kress from the GIZ. Um, in order to introduce your um, presentation, I will ask you uh, maybe one question. Uh, what are the best practices out there based on your projects around water and wastewater companies for climate mitigation? Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's precisely a, a good question because that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I hope you can hear me well also online. Um, and yeah, thank you for having us. Thank you to IWA and to the French Water Partnership for including us in the session today. Uh, so I will talk about uh, our project, the Wacklam project. Wacklam uh, stands for Water and Wastewater Companies for Climate Mitigation. Um, and on the first slide, I will um, it's like a summary of the project characteristics. Um, it's actually the oldest or the first global uh, initiative sponsored by the German uh, Federal Ministry for the Environment, which is about uh, water and mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so we started in at the end of 2013 or the beginning of 2014 uh, with implementing the project. Uh, so we gathered a lot of experience in these years and uh, actually I am here uh, at World Water Week this year, uh, including for sharing our lessons and our, our experiences so that if others want to continue the journey towards uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the water and wastewater sector, that they don't have to, to make the same uh, experiences that we did or that they can benefit from some of our lessons. Um, our partner countries are um, Mexico, Peru, Thailand, and Jordan. Uh, Thailand was our partner country until 2018, and Jordan joined the project in 2016. Um, and we have a very strong focus on urban water and wastewater ut utilities. Um, so we don't, uh, we are not active in end user um, uh, reducing energy which was mentioned before uh, a lot in the, in the previous presentations, but we focus on the work of the utilities. Um, so I will go to the next slide. Please don't be too shocked for, uh, when you see this slide. Uh, actually, it looks better on the, on the big screen than here on the small one. Um, so one thing we learned is if you want to really change uh, sustainably how uh, greenhouse gases are considered in, in the national uh, and local water and wastewater sector, you need to have in mind the local level, the national level, and the international level. And maybe starting down with the local level, um, I think I'm now having a laser pointer, yes. Um, of course, we work on the ground with utilities. Um, that's maybe where the, where the main focus is, because that's where the action takes place. Uh, but it's always also important to work with the ministries uh, who who are responsible for water and wastewater management in the countries. Um, and it's key 
uh, as as always in development cooperation when it comes to climate change that the environmental ministries who are or which are usually responsible for climate change as well and for reporting to the UNFCCC uh, that they have a good relationship with the water ministries uh, finance is a big is an important issue um, and we um, we have some some good uh, results in in this regard especially in mexico which i will mention later on and it goes up to the international um, level so international water sector institutions i think this is you guys uh, so i'm i'm here to to also fulfill this part of our big picture and something we we found each time it's more, more and more important is uh, to take a look at the consulting economy um, and at the consulting firms at international and national level uh, because they are in the end the guys uh, which are hired by uh, by the utilities or by the governments and if they know how to measure greenhouse gas emissions and how to reduce them uh, it helps it can help us a lot so um that's our our results on the ground uh, the project will conclude at the end of this year and that's what uh, we achieved in our three partner countries as i said thailand uh, is not our partner country anymore but i will say something about thailand anyway um, and I like to hear in the previous um, presentations, uh, especially by Corinne, um, how how different things are on the ground, and that's that's also why our focus is so different in each country. Uh, so Jordan is uh, using, uh, yeah, ninety five percent of the electricity generation from fossil fuels, uh, so much more than France, but even more than Germany. Um, and a lot of this um, electricity is used by the water sector. Uh, because of groundwater pumping and often inefficient pumping also there are many water losses in the system uh, so what what we did uh, in jordan we helped our uh, partners to exchange groundwater pumps uh, to get more energy efficient ones and only this uh, caused a very very big uh, reduction in emissions by more than half and uh, what's important for uh, for us and for the partner is also the reduction in energy use electricity use and electricity costs uh, and we learned that it's important to always see the two sides so for us it's it's very important to reduce greenhouse gas emissions for the countries as well because they uh, also are committed to reducing emissions by the ndcs um, but there are usually also co-benefits like in this case energy costs which decrease uh, then in mexico and peru uh, we have a very different energy mix um, it's much less than uh, than the amount of uh, or than the share in Jordan, which is using uh, fossil fuels, and and in these two countries we focus more on methane emissions. Uh, in in Mexico, our partner has extended the wastewater collection system, and by this uh, share um, saved almost fifty percent of the greenhouse gas emissions in the wastewater system, uh, ninety two percent of which is methane. And that's particularly important because um, Mexico is the third largest uh, methane emitter from wastewater management. Um, so there's, you see, wa water can really uh, contribute a lot to, to reducing emissions, uh, particularly methane in this case. Uh, in Peru, uh, especially in the Andean regions, uh, most of the energy is uh, produced by uh, hydropower. So also there we did not uh, do a lot on, on energy savings, um, but uh, our partner in Peru, which is Ceda Cusco in the, uh, in the town of Cusco in the south of Peru, which is close to Machu Picchu, so you, some of you might know it, um, they exchanged or they improved the whole sludge management part. Um, they, uh, um, they installed a biogas generation system and they are now uh, generating electricity from biogas and using it and there's also a co-benefit in this case um, there's also economic co-benefit because they produce their own energy uh, but also they told us that the neighborhood next to the treatment plant smelled pretty bad uh, and so people who are living in this area often vulnerable vulnerable people to the impacts of climate change uh, also have a benefit from from a better environment around this place Oh, I said I would say something about Thailand. Um, so uh, in Thailand, uh, we did a study on on the pollution of the Ping River in Chiang Mai. Um, and we found out 
a lot of the pollution is from leakage in the wastewater system and the wastewater collection system and our partner as a result uh, repaired many many leakages uh, in in this wastewater system uh, so we we uh, saved um, i think 20 percent of the greenhouse gas emissions in that case and um, yeah it's the two uh, the two uh, cases peru and thailand are uh, featured in the in the book which uh, Corinne explained in the beginning all right but as um, as I showed you on one of the first on this complex slide um, it would not be enough to only work at the local level to to reduce greenhouse gas emissions on the ground uh, so um, we also were always in close contact with the national governments sometimes in, in bigger countries like Mexico also with the regional uh, administrations um, yeah also if you have nine years of, of project you know governments change um, and sometimes we found that it's easier to to work with uh, the local governments or the regional governments if the national government is at the moment not prioritizing water or is not prioritizing mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions um, so just some examples in jordan um, we we uh, succeeded in prioritizing uh, greenhouse gas mitigation in the water sector through making it part of the NDC uh, P action plan um, and NDC partnership action plan. Um, we also did something on climate risk management. So we also have a small component on adaptation in our program. Um, this, this Mexican um, example means that uh, there is a new um, water investment, water sector utility investment project uh, financed by the Inter-American Development Bank, and they decided to use our methodology uh, for uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions in utilities, and it's one of their performance key indicators. Um, so I think that's, that's a good way to institutionalize uh, what we did. Uh, Peru, um, I, I was, was interesting to see uh, how planning happens in France, uh, and I, I remember that there was a three-year period where um, I think wastewater uh, utilities at least have to plan for for mitigation uh, and to prioritize strategies. So in Peru, we don't have three years, but we have every five years uh, the need to to uh, update uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation plans. And uh, they're not just our partner utility, but uh, 23 utilities doing these plans and updating it uh, each couple of years. So that's how we institutionalize uh, our our um, achievements. Um, also, I will just go to the global level here. Um, our tool ECAM, which was also mentioned before, and I will uh, talk more about la later on, uh, was used in a development bank loan project for, for project screening. So we're working with the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, which used it in, in some cases in Argentina when they prepared projects. And uh, they found that uh, like the more advanced utilities, like the one of Buenos Aires, uh, with um, yeah, people who, who know about the issue, they can make great use of, of our methodologies, but also, also those who don't, uh, who'd never heard about the issue and uh, who, who might think uh, mitigation is rather a thing of, of energy and maybe transport. Um, yeah, and we trained almost 500 experts uh, globally on our tool and on, uh, yeah, generally on low carbon water and wastewater management. So here's some of our products uh, together with uh, IWA, which is our implementing partner of the project. Um, as I said, our project will conclude at the end of the year, uh, but we are very uh, lucky and happy that IWA is taking over the, the main products on their knowledge platform, climatesmartwater.org. Um, one of them is ECAM, which I will, will tell you later, but also this platform provides a space for exchange for utilities on how do can we mitigate greenhouse gas emissions, but also how can we adapt to the impacts of climate change? Um, there's also an e-learning, which is one of our products. If you're interested, you can go to workroom.org slash e-learning. Maybe you can also just Google it. It's pretty new. So I hope Google has it already in their, in their list. Uh, we don't have it in French, but we have it in, in English and in Spanish. Um, I think this ECAM is, is maybe our signature tool. That's what uh, the Rockland program is most known for. Uh, ECAM stands for Energy Performance and Carbon Emissions Assessment and Monitoring Tool. Um, 
and it's uh, there's just a new version uh, complying with the newest IPCC 2019 refinement of its methodology. It's used by our partner countries. Uh, it's also used by some uh, multilateral development banks, also by our German uh, development bank KFW. Uh, and it was also interesting to hear that uh, at least in the wastewater sector, uh, our French colleagues are also at least using it for for building on it uh, and it's uh, it's a free and open source tool so everybody is also free to use the code uh, and to to adapt it for their own needs uh, our peruvian colleagues are, and our mexican colleagues as well are, are now uh, using it as a national standard tool for mitigation in their sectors um, also iwa was leading um, this product Brooklyn roadmap and it shows you how to yeah, how to combine mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions with priorities for utilities such as uh, operational efficiency, cost effectiveness. Um, and I believe it's also on the climatesmartwater.org web page. Um, we did now, we had many discussions with, yeah, with research institutions, with uh, practitioners around how do we account for greenhouse gases and uh, we found that the methodology which we use, which complies with the IPCC methodology, is not like the only one. Um, and there are different opinions. Uh, also in Germany, it seems like uh, the news IPCC or not everything of the news IPCC uh, report is, is already um, adopted. Uh, so we produce a document discussing the equations and the methodologies behind our tool and also alternatives and uh, advantages and disadvantages of both. And this is the last thing we will do as a project, um, uh, guidelines for greenhouse gas reporting. Um, the reason is we were contacted many times by ministries and utilities from the water sector, also consultants which said, uh, we want to report our greenhouse gas emissions to our national government and from there to the international level to the UNFCCC, but we don't know how to how to approach them, what is the right process, is it the greenhouse gas inventory, um, or is it the NDC monitoring or the MRV, uh, so that will be the the objective of this uh, of these guidelines to find out which are the uh, yeah the the elements of the process where um, the water sector can contribute to. So this is my last slide. Um, main lessons learned. Um, we tried to yeah to squeeze nine years of project experience into these slides. And here are some of our main lessons learned. The first one is not surprising, and I think you wouldn't have shown up today if you don't agree with that. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions from water and wastewater are, are relevant and are important. Um, it's difficult to estimate uh, how, how high they are and what the share is in, in global emissions, as explained in the presentations before. Uh, but I think we showed that, that water can, can contribute quite a lot, a significant share of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, Co-benefits is super important um, when, like when discussing with partners with emerging countries or in industrialized and, and developing countries. Um, there are so many core benefits when you reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, for example, operational efficiency often becomes better through improved energy efficiency. Uh, optimization of processes is also a core benefit and environmental core benefits uh, like in the case of Peru. Uh, so that's always one thing uh, we would uh, um, we think it's important to to uh, to build on when discussing. Uh, mitigation. Economic viability is not enough. Uh, that's one thing which uh, surprised us a bit uh, because when we started the project, the assumption was uh, we help countries to show that um, mitigating greenhouse gas emissions in the water sector is not only good for the environment and for the climate, but also pays off. Um, however, not in all countries. Um, yeah, um, economic um, aspects are the biggest priority, I would say. Um, it's often you have the government, the energy ministry, the water ministry, and uh, yeah, maybe it's 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 easier to to discuss about the electricity tariff than to improve energy efficiency, just as an example. Uh, so if uh, we still think it's it's good to to use this argument, uh, economic. Uh, Viability is, is, is one benefit uh, of mitigation or can be one benefit, but it, 
you also need to take a look at the institutional environment and and what what is the terrorist system like and do they really care that much about uh, their economic processes um that's more uh, obvious um, if there is an adaptation process which we have oftentimes in the water sector it might be easy to to add mitigation uh, not to wait for doing a specific another mitigation process but maybe jump on an existing project on adaptation because this is often the priority um yeah high level agreements um this um, this speaks specifically to COP20 in Peru. Uh, we believe that we were so successful successful in Peru because COP20 happened many years ago. And at that point, um, the government was very active and, and promised many things, like in every country when, when you have such a conference. Um, maybe we will have hopefully something like that in Egypt uh, this year. Um, and also the, the Global Methane Pledge, uh, which was accorded last year uh, in, um, um, and at COP26. Uh, also, we felt that it, it made more relevant what we do on methane savings. Um, and the, the last thing, uh, something we had to learn, um, water people need to understand how, yeah, how greenhouse gas emissions work, how you can measure them, how you can transfer between methane, carbon, and, and, and nitrous oxide, um, how you can reduce them, and how the cooperation happens. What are the processes? Uh, who do you need to talk to to report your greenhouse gas emissions? Um, so these are our main lessons. Uh, if you want to become active on, on saving greenhouse gas emissions in the water and wastewater sector, uh, please feel free to reach out to us uh, because our project will be over, but we will still be there. Thank you. So I go over there, right? Yeah. Thank you, Martin, for this uh, presentation. Uh, actually, now we can open the session for question for from the audience so i will go to you and give you the mic and uh, i think we have uh, or other online speakers also uh, on the line that can uh, answer you so yeah is there any questions Hello, I just want to say thank you very much for your presentations. Um, I think it's uh, very critical for um, climate, climate change mitigation, but as well um, for wastewater and water treatment. Uh, my name is Kyle Rezik. I am a student at UNC Chapel Hill in the graduate program for public health engineering with a focus on water and wastewater treatment. So this was very relevant to my studies. And my question is, is that both desalination, the process of that, as well as water reuse can be very energy intensive and require large amounts of energy, but there could be very viable alternatives to water security issues that we're facing worldwide. And has ener energy generation from biogas from generated from wastewater treatment plants, has that been used before or has that been considered to power the processes for those drinking water treatment options? Who wants to answer that? Okay. Uh, well, I I can start, and then maybe you can um, add add the, a few more. So, um, desalination or recycling water is is definitely um, very important in in places where it's water scarcity, but it should always be looked at after you you've started and, and you keep implementing a plan to reduce water usage. So the first action to take is reducing the amount of water that is needed. Um, but in, in many places in, on the planet, it, it's not enough to just reduce, to actually um, meet the balance between what water is available in that sub-basin where your city stands or your, where your industries stand and um the needs even once you've reduced so just to to say that uh, indeed these processes are very energy intensive and they shouldn't be looked at as the only solution they're the second solution after having looked at reducing um 
and then regarding powering these um, energy intensive technologies with renewable energies because you're talking about the biogas from the wastewater but it could be solar energy wind energy i mean it, there are many other renewable energies this is definitely um high on the radar of all the all the companies and all the 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 utilities that look at implementing these solutions to have renewable energies power uh these systems jen yeah <laughs> Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, uh, I would probably say, but uh, you you should look at that. Uh, that if you have a wastewater treatment uh, for a certain volume of water, probably you you will be able to uh, to do a very small or much more smaller desalination plant. That is, the consumption of uh, for desalination is higher in proportion of cubic meter than what you can produce on a wastewater plant. So, as Corinne said. Uh, uh, when you need definitively to make desalination, uh, if you have no other solution, now there are some um, some experience and which were quite uh, well working uh, using uh, using a renewal uh, energy. It was surprising because um, uh, uh, in Australia they have done that. They are big project with renewal energy, and uh, surprisingly. Uh, the price of uh, the desalination plant with renewable energy was not higher than with traditional energy uh, five or eight years ago. And um, I say surprisingly, because uh, I would have been expecting that it could have been more costly. But in fact, when you were doing the dimensioning of the um, desalination plant, it was um, more economically Able, people were more able to estimate the cost of long-term renewable energy than what could happen with um, uh, biofuel energy or things like that, because they were they were a bit worried about how will the cost of that energy go up and down. And uh, it's it's true that uh, what we see today is that. Uh, uh, some uh, renewable energy on long term can be at less less expensive than uh, um, other. So I think when you have to go to desalination or recycling uh, because you have no other solution and so you need energy, you have to work on renewal, uh, solar, wind, uh, or uh, but probably solar and wind rather than biological. I mean. I agree uh, with you. Um, I would like to add to uh, what you said about about um, uh, desalination should not be the first priority. I, I totally agree to that. Uh, first should go demand management, reducing uh, water use, and one particular uh, sub element, in my opinion, is is water loss reduction uh, because often, especially in those places which are water scarce. Uh, up to 50 percent of the water gets gets lost before it reaches anybody uh, it reaches the groundwater often which is you can say okay at least uh, the groundwater uh, doesn't get empty as, as quick uh, but still i think that that's a particular form of, of reducing water demand uh, in the long term um, and the second thing uh, on uh, on using biogas that's what we are doing in peru or what our peruvian colleagues are doing so we didn't pay for for their operations it was them who invested in in biogas uh, utilization and and co-generation for energy from biogas um, and in europe there are already i think a couple of of uh, utilities uh, which became uh, all self-sufficient uh, using their own energy sometimes even uh, even feeding energy into the public grid, so even even more than self-sufficient. And then we can go there. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Aldona. Um, I have a question for Anthony. So my background is in applied environmental science, and I actually did uh, research in nitrous oxide measurement at wastewater treatment plant in the southwest uh, Sweden. 
And what I found the most problems here, here for researchers and also for utilities, they don't know how to measure nitrous oxide accurately and precisely. So we cannot really come with numbers and percentage of how much uh, nitrous oxide that we contribute from the wastewater treatment plant. So my question is, uh, maybe this is a question that needs uh, to be answered for researchers how to convince a wastewater utility when we are doing this kind of research and we want to measure greenhouse gas in the wastewater, what argument that sh we should bring uh, to the engineers or utility in general so they are convinced enough that we are doing very important research. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I don't know if I have the, the answer of your, of your question, but uh, in SIAP we have a department uh, which is uh, focused on uh, innovation and measurement. Uh, and uh, their work is to, to, um, to highlight all the research and to, to do some innovation about this. Um, this is already in SIAP, but uh, if you are um, starting, uh, I, <laughs> I don't have uh, the clue, maybe Corinne. Uh, <laughs> yeah, actually what SIAP has been doing is fantastic. They've been measuring their emissions already since a few years ago. Um, it is, as you say, it is a very complicated process to measure N2O emissions from a process. And um, actually, for those who want to learn more on this, there is currently a masterclass on the IWA website. If you go to IWA Learn, there's a masterclass and five sessions that you can watch on replay that covers a lot of that. Uh, but the idea is to actually have just a few places where this measurement is made um, and communicate those results so that not all treatment plants have to do this because it's so complex. And then for those who are ready to tackle the issue and really start um, addressing their emissions, um, they can also uh, work with um, AI simulations. So there are a few tools on the market that enable um, to kind of um, uh, simulate what is happening in your plant. So you might need to actually do a measure um, for a month or so, but then it's the costs are not so high. And then the rest of the time it runs on an AI algorithm. Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, Martin Gamble, uh, <clears throat> thank you for excellent presentations. I have a um, a comment which is that the, all the buses in Stockholm run on biogas from wastewater sludge treatment right here in this city so you know there's something obviously we need to replicate and do elsewhere uh, the last presentation your comment on the economic viability I would I don't know that we're talking about economic viability as in cost benefit analysis of all the different dimensions of what we're talking about here which is very complex to unpack from an economic perspective or whether you were talking about the financial impact for utilities, which are obviously two different things. But I was also very fascinated to learn from uh, um, from the gentleman from Paris about looking at the urine diversion. I was aware of this work from some five years ago that it was being planned um, um, with the objective of, of reversing um, pollution in the Seine. And it's very fascinating to hear that you're looking at it from a perspective of greenhouse gas emissions. I was wondering, if you do the urine diversion and you take out the, the nitrogen from the wastewater, does that mean that you are going to look at different wastewater treatment technologies? Or does it mean that the, the existing wastewater treatment, if we can measure it properly, will, um, as a result, um, release less NO2? Um, that would be great to understand. Thank you. Um, we, we put on the table all the, um, the, um, the tools we can do for degrees uh, the emission from N2O. And one of them, it was to, to, to put uh, outside the nitrogen of the wastewater. So we think, obviously, of uh, urine source separation, but it's only on, on paper. And we don't uh, thought about different uh, kind of uh, treatment. Or uh, how can we systematize this uh, kind of uh, separation for all the Paris uh, areas? This is huge. We have to do some uh, 
uh, titanesque uh, <laughs> work. Uh, but uh, in Paris, is, they start uh, like uh, some project, a building project, we are starting to, to do some urine source separation. And all the arguments, are, all the benefits of separation of urine are exposed to agriculture, to uh, wastewater um, um, reduction, pollution in water. And finally, with uh, greenhouse gas. So this is really the start of the of the of this thing. Yeah, thank you for your remark on uh, economic or financial viability. Uh, I think I should have said financial. Um, we are actually my colleagues are now starting to work on a. Uh, on a document, on a scientific paper about right this question exactly. Um, you're welcome to be a reviewer of that if you're interested. Yeah. <laughs> Any other question? Yes. Thank you. Uh, John Ikeda, Castalia Strategic Advisors. Uh, so I was on a finance panel earlier this week and one of the big messages was water finance is climate finance. And, and I'm really curious to hear if you, if any of you have any good examples of, you know, being able to use this evidence around the emissions that are avoided to mobilize you know, climate finance from you know, climate funds or carbon offsets, you know, if there's any specific examples that you've seen uh, that you think are, uh, you know, should be replicated elsewhere. Um, for the SIAP, the, the, the main finance uh, of the state came from and to uh, water treatment quality and the same uh, quality. There's still no um, financial about uh, greenhouse uh, houses. So um, we will ask uh, the state of France <laughs> if we can have uh, some ads. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. So I'm I'm wondering if you are asking specifically on mitigation or adaptation and mitigation or both combined. Um, so I think it's not a new message. Um, I think uh, uh, water changes, climate change, and all these messages were around in Stockholm for many years. Um, the issue was always like from a from a climate perspective. Uh, water people sometimes seemed like they want to take the money, but they don't really want to change anything in how they do the projects. And uh, the argument is often, if we if we care about water resources, of course it com contributes to adaptation to climate change because people might use less water. But there was all, always, or not always, but in in some cases, uh, not enough like uh, analysis of the case and what is the difference. What what do you do differently with climate change and without climate change? Um, in my opinion, though, the climate funds are now also increasingly. Uh, asking for uh, co-benefits on mitigation if you do an adaptation project. So you also have to take a look at that part uh, of the story. Uh, and I think it's it's easy then to to also uh, to add mitigation benefits. Uh, in our subsector, uh, water and wastewater utilities, uh, you can build on our experience and on, on their experience already in other subsectors, uh, like in water resources management, uh, peatlands management, uh, which is maybe part water, part part natural natural systems. It's still more difficult, but there is a lot of research being done on that uh, part too. Um, and yeah, I believe we we are much stronger if we show that we took a look at the adaptation side um, thoroughly, but also at the mitigation side. Yeah, you uh, wanted to add something? Uh, yeah, I was quite disappointed when the uh, Green Fund started to work because I, uh, the Green Fund has financed very few water projects and uh, I was a bit disappointed. Uh, one reason of it probably is that they like to see <clears throat> the real impact of the fund. And so until we are able as professionals to measure well what is the reality of today, how much we pollute how much uh, we, we have uh, before, then you can really uh, expect to have some uh, funds because then you can see that it's improved or not. So I think it is part also of our responsibility 
It's true that the water business has mainly work at the beginning on adaptation, because of course we are a bit worried about uh, what will happen. Uh, that's true that if we work both adaptation and mitigation, but to be uh, to receive funds on uh, mitigation, we really need to show before what we expect, uh, what we are going to do, and what will be the real impact. So until we had some real tools and uh, clear measurement, which show in reality that the water uh, itself has an impact, clear impact uh, on, um, on the uh, climate change, uh, it was probably not so easy to convince uh, to have funds. So I think it's part of the process is to be more, to show more the reality and to accept that as professional, we, we have an impact on, on climate change. Thank you. Is there any other questions? Different perspective to what was just said, but uh, since uh, Diane talked about the Green Fund, um, on another topic that is not about water and sanitation utilities, but I will mention on the financial part that um, um, one of the figures that we like to bring out in, uh, into use at the French Water Partnership is that nature-based solutions uh, you know, with water as related to water uh, apparently only represented to IUCN figure 1% uh, of the investments in water. So <laughs> it says something about the, what it is we're investing in. you um if there is no further question maybe a last one from me uh, um uh, especially targeted at uh corinne and diane um i wanted to ask you if you have like concrete examples of um uh iwa utilities like members utilities that have uh, an aggressive policy uh for reducing the consumption uh of their customers thank you well i can speak about um utility uh, there is two utilities which uh, which i can uh, speak about the first is the uh, perth the uh, city of perth in australia you know that australia uh, is a country which uh, uh, has not so many so much water and they had to develop new resources and the uh, Perth um, city was uh, calculating that they should invest in a desalination plant and they decided not to do it but to have an aggressive policy in order to reduce consumption were able to show that finally, that was economical because investing a new plant, which will be used from time to time, but not always. And on the other hand, investing in a policy where they ask people to reduce, where they help them to reduce, where they give them the means to reduce. For example, they were giving some small uh, device in order to put in their shower. And after two or three minutes, the shower, the, the device was making music, things like that. So if you do that, I think it is quite a good example. So Press uh, City is really a, a good example. Of course, Singapore, everybody knows about Singapore. Singapore is uh, depending on Malaysia for uh, having some resource. They have been obliged to develop all kinds of um, new resources. But meanwhile, they do that. They have uh, really a policy trying to help people to know how much water they consume, try to reduce. They give them even a shower tap um, in order to, to be able to fool and thing. So I think there are some places, of course, for the moment, it's most of the time when they have a, uh, an urgent need. So you need a very strong utility to be able to convince people, but there are very good uh, examples. And uh, maybe I would just also refer to uh, a discussion I had uh, once with an uh, Italian regulator, uh, because because Italy also sometimes suffer from a lack of water. And they were thinking of having an increasive price of water, uh, saying that if you increase the price of the water after a certain amount of water, it's help people to reduce it. And it gives you revenues because the price is more. So of course, my question was, uh, when do you start 
uh, at which level do you start the increasing of water? And the answer was not clear, but uh, probably they were not so precise at the time, but they said, oh, 40 liter per day per person. Yeah. 40 liter per day per person is low. Uh, of course, you need to know how many people are in the house, so it's complex, but um, it's true that it is important. And last remark may be because um, they were said that um, Buenos Aires has an active action on, on, uh, on wastewater and so on, but they still don't have meter. They still doesn't have meter on the water side. So people are still consuming something like 300 liters per day per person or 400 because no metering. So you have a good example. On my opinion, Buenos Aires is a bad example because if you don't put meter, I mean, people are wasting. Thank you. Uh, so it is now time to uh, wrap it up. <laughs> Sorry, Corinne. <laughs> it's okay. um, uh, so thank you. I think we can uh, give a round of applause to all of our speakers today. And uh, and thank you to 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 have uh, attended the session and uh, just to say that uh, the the book that was mentioned before is available on the French Water Partnership uh, website, both in English and in French, and uh, and also on the International Water Association website, so you can easily find it online. And uh, yeah, thank you. Have a good day. Hello. Thank you.